Hey everyone, welcome back to another course. This is going to be a short one on a simple Node.js project which we'll be creating, which is going to be just a login logout project. You are watching one of the modules of Node.js backend developer learning path and we have covered all of the previous stuff so far. So if you are, if you want to become a backend developer, a good backend developer, you can go ahead and start following this learning path. The link for this should be in below description if you're watching this on YouTube or some other platform. If you're watching this on CodeDam itself, then of course you know how to follow this along. So let's just go ahead and start working in this little project and we're gonna be taking a look at how you can implement authentication using Node.js, but not only that, also following some of the best practices along the way and things you should know as a good developer. So that's all for this introduction video. I'm going to see you in the next one really soon. All right, guys, welcome back. And in this video, let's just go ahead and start our little project. This is just going to be a project where we will be authenticating users and registering them with the help of usernames and passwords. This is not going to be an OAuth project, right? We're going to be coming to that later on in the in the learning path module but you should know how to register and store passwords securely and just have the whole process going on smoothly with the actual login logout system as well. So let's just go ahead and take a look. You can see I have a very simple express server and this is the file structure which we have, right? I have installed just express at the moment. And once you do that, you can just set it up like this. And this is the file which is being served right here, right? So if I go ahead and write h1, hello you could see that if i refresh this this is what we get right so first things first we have to create a registration form right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to very quickly create a form and i'm going to just give it an id of registration form right and we could probably say h1 register registration and i'm not really going to focus a lot into css part because our main priority would be to get node server up and working so let's just go ahead and quickly introduce two fields just input type text value not really value but placeholder your username or email maybe whatever it is right and the second one is going to be password and that one would be the password of the user right so once we have this going on we can just quickly throw in a script which just says that form is document dot get element by id and we pick up the reg form element right and whenever that form submits we want to fire a listener right so i want to say register user right so now we can go ahead and create a function called register user right here which is going to receive an event just like you would have received with any other event listener like click or double click and first thing is we want to say event.prevent default. Why is that? Because the default behavior of the forms is to refresh the page, right? And we don't really want to refresh or navigate the page away to whatever you have spe specified as the action here, right? But we don't really want to do that. We want the JS to handle it. So we're going to be just preventing anything which is, which is a default action. So we do that with event.prevent default. Let's just go ahead and get the username and password now so i'm going to say this is going to have an id of username and this is going to have an id of password right so our username is going to be document.get element by id username and similar thing for password as well so there we have it right so we have username and password now we want to send this data to our node server right so when you send the data to a backend there are a multiple there are multiple ways to send some data Right, so the first one is obviously sending the data as JSON, send data as JSON, which is very common, very common when you are using JS, right? The other one is send, sending data as, uh, you know, URL encoded. Now, by default, when you use forms, this is what uh, is being used by default, right? And JSON is like very popular among Node, which is my personal observation. And URL encoded is very popular among backends like PHP, right? So we're going to be using JSON to send the data, not URL encoded, because JSON brings in a lot of good support out of the box in JavaScript. 
URL encoded also brings that, but not so much. So let's just go ahead and use JSON to send the data. And uh, the way we, we're gonna do it is by just making use of a simple fetch, which is a, you know, a utility which is provided by browser itself to make HTTP calls. And I'm just gonna say, I want to send it to API slash register. And I want to say the method for this would be post. The headers would consist of one important header, which is gonna be saying content type. And this is where our content type would go, right? So just like we mentioned, this is gonna be application JSON for us. So I'm just gonna keep it application JSON. If you wanted to have a URL encoded, you're gonna to have to change the content type here. But for the most part, you're gonna always keep it like this when you're sending JSON data. Now in body, here is where your JSON would go, but just before doing that, you want to stringify your JSON, right? Because this is the actual raw body which you write in the request, right? So we want to say username and password just like that. So what's happening here is we are having username and password getting from the from the input fields and then we pass it along the server, right? And you can optionally wait on this because we already have the async in place. And I can say result from server, something like this. And probably then I want to say, I also want to convert the result from server into JSON. So what's essentially happening, just to give you an overview again, we create a form whenever somebody clicks on that summit button, which is not, which is something we have not created yet. So let's just go ahead and do that value submit form. So whenever somebody clicks on this, this function gets called, this thing runs and uh, you know, this request is made to the server and the result variable contains what the server responds. So if you go ahead and do that, if you go ahead and refresh this, you can see we got a registration form. If I go to my networks tab, if I enter something, and one thing you can do is just, which just personally annoys me, is you can just go ahead and say auto complete as off here, right? Refresh right here, summit form. And obviously we get errors because our backend is not ready yet, right? You can see that we get cannot post API register. But if you go to headers all the way down, what you're gonna see is that you could see that you have username and password as empty objects. So what you really want is the value, not the DOM objects, right? So let's just go ahead and refresh this. And now when we summit it, you can see that we get the passwords and username correctly, but our backend is of course not ready. So let's just go ahead and do that. In the next video, we're gonna be doing a bunch of more changes on the front end part, not in terms of CSS, but in terms of security. We're gonna be also having a reCAPTCHA form implemented, but that would be at the end of the series because we don't really want to have a lot of friction going on right away. So that's all for this video. I'm gonna see you in the next one really soon. Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, let's just go ahead and take a look at what we can do on the server side to receive this data, right? So first things first, we are seeing that the request we are making is of type post. And the second thing is we are making use of JSON to send the data. With that information, that is probably enough to get us started with Express. So I'm gonna create a new route, API slash register. Right, and this is gonna be a request response sort of function. And I'm just gonna make this async because we're gonna be making a bunch of database calls here. So once we have this in place, the next thing I want to do is I want to just console log, for example, request.body, right? And what you're gonna see is request.body is actually empty because by default Express does not parse the JSON which is being sent in the request, right? So you're gonna not get this out of the box. So for this, we have to install another module and that is gonna be body parser. So once, oops, yarn add body parser, you can use NPM as well if you want, but I'm just using yarn. So once you have that, you can import body parser like this, require body parser. And once you do that, you can basically go ahead and say app.use body parser dot json and that's it. So this is just a middleware for Express to decode the body which is coming in, right? So this would actually give you the JSON representation of your body, if it is JSON, if it is malformed or you know, just invalid JSON, then it will throw an error, 
right? So yeah, that's that's basically it. And uh, if we go ahead and just say res.json status, okay, right? This would just take care of everything, like setting the headers and everything. Like we used to, we have to manually set headers here, right? But if you use res.json on the server, it will automatically set the headers. So if you refresh it, oops, I think we have closed the server. Node mon server.js. So if we refresh it, we're gonna see if I write this, we get a 200 okay. The server says status okay, but nothing is really going on, right? So let's just go ahead and make sure something is going on. So I'm gonna bring in mongoose. I already have mongoose installed. You might want to do mongoose installation by saying yarn add mongoose or npm install mongoose, whatever it is. So once you bring in mongoose, the next step is to connect mongoose, right? So I'm going to say mongoose.connect and then I'm going to specify mongodb localhost 27017 and this would be, um, I don't know, let's say database or maybe like, you know, login app db, something like that. Now, if you want to know more about mongoose and, you know, how you work with mongodb in general, then I would recommend you to go to this database introduction section where we actually cover MongoDB, the crux of MongoDB and the crash course sort of thing in a much better way, right? So I won't be going through basics of MongoDB and Mongoose in this one. I'm assuming that you are already familiar with it. So there's that, right? Um, you can go ahead and, you know, just go ahead and pass in some parameters like use new URL parser to true to, you know, just, just get rid of those warnings. You can say use unified topology as well. And this will just, you know, just get rid of warnings, right? If you're somebody like me who do not really like a lot of warnings, so you can have that. So once we do this, the next step is to create a model for our user, right? So I'm going to create a new folder saying model, and I'm going to create a user.js right here. Now, the reason we are creating a model is that so we actually sort of enforce a schema, number one, on the database. And number two is that makes our life a little bit more easy in terms of managing data flow with Node.js. So first things first, again, I'm going to import mongoose from mongoose, right? And I'm going to create a new user schema, schema like this. And I'm going to say mongoose dot uh, schema. And we want to initialize it with new. And here's the place where we pass in the information for our schema, right? So I'm going to say username is going to be of type string. And it is always required, right? You cannot create a user without a username, obviously. And password is also going to be of type string. And it is required as well. One more thing which you can do as a good practice is you can enforce a unique field test here itself, right? So this unique means that username has to be unique, right? It cannot, you know, two records cannot have same username. So this unique, by the way, is implemented using indexes in MongoDB, right? It is not like Mongoose will make two calls to database to determine if the, if the record is unique or not. It will just make one call. If MongoDB allows it, it's fine. If it does not, that means the record was not unique, right? So yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for the schema part. And just to, you know, wrap up, wrap this thing up, what we're going to do is register this as a model in Mongoose. So I'm going to say this model is mongoose.model. And I'm going to specify this as user schema or user model or whatever you want. We will not be using model like this, uh, but instead of exports, uh, let's see, module.exports model. We'll be actually importing this file and then using the model, right? One quick thing again is you can do and specify the collection to be users, right? Because you don't really want your collection to be dynamic based on the name of your model. So. With that being done, now we can go ahead and work with the user collection once we import it. So I'm going to say user is require model user, right? And now we can have a bunch of great methods, but we have an error. So let's see. Uh, the second argument to model must be a POJO or string. Interesting. So the second argument of the model 
I think we misspelled that. This should have been a lowercase, not an uppercase, right? So anyway, once we have that, let me just go ahead and refresh this real quick, right? So there we go. And uh, now we would have a bunch of useful methods linked to our user model, right? So you can see that I can create, I can delete, I can find all that good stuff based on our schema itself, right? So yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. In the next one, let's just go ahead and see how we can create a user and how we can probably log in the user as well in the next one. So that's all for this one. I'm gonna see you in the next one really soon. Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, let's just go ahead and take a look at how you should actually register a user using the correct way, right? So first things first, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually just gonna show you what we get in the request.body. So if I go ahead and hit save, and if we go ahead and take a look here, if I submit this, you can see if I go back to the console, nope, not this one, this one, you can see that we have a username and password. And actually we have a, a you know, warning again in the mongoose connection. So let me just go ahead and fix it real quick. I think this is, this is what the option was, right? Use create index true. Yeah, so the warning is gone and we are good. So anyway, you could see that if I submit it here, we have username and passwords, right? Now, as a developer, I mean, it's fine when you're developing locally, you can see passwords and everything, but when you store it in a database, all sorts of people have access to database. And I'm, I mean, internally, right? If you're running a company or a startup, you might have people who are working as analysts right? So they are just analyzing data. There might be some scripts reading databases, right? Uh, if you're creating, I don't know, some sort of way to interact for others to interact with your database, why would you do that? But you know, just an idea, then you might have an open API access to your database. So, well, this is, this is a little bit of a stretch, but anyway, the, the point I wanted to convey is that your database is not the place where you should store passwords in plain text, right? You want to encrypt the password somehow, but you also want to make sure that other people are able to authenticate themselves easily. So what we do is we follow a practice known as hashing the passwords, right? What is hashing the passwords? Well, think about, uh, you know, cooking food, right? So you have all the ingredients, for example, salt, pepper, sugar, oil, whatever it is at the beginning, right? So consider those ingredients as your password or maybe like the ratio in which you use those ingredients as, as your password. Now you go ahead and as a cook, as a chef, so just to create an analogy here we are real quick, cook is gonna be you as a developer, ingredients like salt, uh, pepper, um, let's see, what else did I talk about? Oil and vegetables. I don't know, it could be anything. These are like password, parts of passwords, right? Whatever. So as a cook, what you do is you, you know, just create food out of this thing, right? So this thing is converted into a food like thing food, basically not really food like thing. But can you tell me once you have the final food with you, can you tell me the exact ratios of whatever ingredients? Now there might be a lot of ingredients here. So can you really tell me the exact ratio of what ingredients did you use? Probably not. Now I'm not saying that it is impossible, but it is improbable, right? Similarly with passwords, what we do is we pass it through a special function, which is a mathematical function, which converts this plain text password into garbage, right? Now this garbage right here is just like your food. Now, you know, it is possible, it is very, very unlikely, but that you are able to reverse this thing to get an actual password. So yeah, I mean, hashing passwords is important in terms of security, because even if your database is leaked somehow, like, you know, even if you are somebody who's working all alone, you might think that why would I need a hashing function then? Even if your database is leaked somehow, then also, um, you know, 
people are not able to reverse all the passwords right they would have they would definitely have a lot of miscomfort and discomfort sort of thing when they are trying to extract real password out of hashes so yeah i mean you should as a developer always always hash the passwords when you are managing them yourself right so the algorithm which we'll be using for you know the library the package which we'll be using is known as bcrypt right and there are a bunch of hashing algorithms that are one way hashing like you know cooking the food there are md5 there are sha1 sha256 sha5112 there's a long list right um but with passwords what we want is we want that not only that they are hashing a particular password into another one a couple of more things are required like you know first of all the collision now i don't i don't really want to get into a depth of this but just to give you an idea the collision should be uh improbable right so collision means that two same sort of strings generating a same hash right so i can say one is also generating this and 100 is also generating this then that is not really you know worth it right and the second thing is that the algorithm should be slow right now this might be this might sound a little bit weird but this is true in case of passwords at least that your hashing algorithm should not be super fast that means it should not be like completed in a couple of clock cycles of the cpu and why is that because this prepares us against the fact that if your uh, database is leaked online then somebody's just not able to brute force at a very high computation uh, speed right because you know if your algorithm is fundamentally slow mathematically then it would be slow to brute force as well and you know just adding a couple of clock cycles on a on a valid attempt would not really hurt you a lot but this would hurt exponentially much to an attacker right who's just trying to brute force a password from a garbage form to an actual password right so these are the two reasons so anyway i think much with the theory let's just go ahead and implement this thing so for this purpose for this uh this this sort of video i'm just going to make use of something known as bcrypt js right which is a js implementation bcrypt js which is a js implementation of the bcrypt library right now bcrypt is a low level library if you install yarn at bcrypt what you're going to get is a node package around uh, i think c or c++ binary right or maybe i don't know c yeah I, i think it's c or c++ so that binary i think is 30 40% faster but it is non portable right so you have to download it install it and compile it on any system you want so i'm just going through going with uh, bcrypt js in this one but if you want you can go with bcrypt as well and the binaries both have same syntax right so because i had installed bcrypt js i'm going to do bcrypt is equal to require bcrypt js right and that's it if you do install bcrypt you can just form with that js and you will be good to go now the next thing i want to do is i want to say that hey first of all let me just go ahead and see i want to hash the password now hash sync is basically a synchronous version which i would say avoid so i want to hash the password first of all let's just get the passwords right so i'm going to get username and password like this request.body right now i want to say that username your password should be hashed so let's just see what bcrypt echoes out now the hash function of bcrypt you can see that it accepts the first argument as the string and the second argument as the salt or number right so salt or number basically just means this number means the how many iterations of bcrypt do you want to run right so you can either go ahead and specify a random string as a salt if you want or you can go ahead and specify a number like 10 or 15 right don't really go crazy with this because that will make your program extremely slow otherwise so 10 15 is a good choice you can go ahead and put 10 or 15 or 20 or whatever you want and this means the just as like i said this just means number of times bcrypt would run on this password 
So let's just go ahead and see what this echoes. So I'm going to go ahead and submit this. And you can see that we get the username password like this. And the password after bcrypt is something like this, right? So it's sort of weird. But uh, um, yeah, that's that's the point of encryption, right? The, the point of hashing that you don't really want it to be guessable. So if I go ahead and, you know, just put a crazy password and submit it. You can see that the password is very long, but our hash is still of fixed length. So this is kind of a, you know, an advantage for us as developers that we have a fixed length of password to store always in the database, right? So irrespective of how long the password user makes, you can always get a fixed length of password. So yeah, I mean, if we go ahead and use this as plain text password, what I can go ahead and say is I can say password is actually bcrypt dot hash sync password and with 10 rounds of salt, right? So this is not really hash sync, just hash. So this is basically the username password combination. Now we have is going to be something which you want to throw in in your database, right? So yeah, that's that's pretty much it for this video. I'm going to see you in the next one real soon in which we'll be actually putting this record in the database. So yeah. See you in the next one real soon. Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, let's just go ahead and take a look at, uh, you know, storing this record in the database now. So we just took a look at all the theory and the exciting stuff in the last video. Let's just go ahead and now actually put this record in the database, right? So what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to throw this in a try catch block. And I'm just going to tell you the reason in a while. Just stick with me here. I'm just going to console log error here and I'm just going to return restoration status error for now. I'm going to explain this why I'm doing this, right? So what I want to try is I want to try to create a record. So I'm going to say user dot create. Remember user is the model of mongoose, which we imported, which is this file right here, right? I'm going to say user dot create, and then I'm going to pass in username and password right so remember the password is you know which the one which we created like this and the plain text this should obviously be plain text password right and uh, this would actually go ahead and create a record for us so i'm going to just say result like this and i'm going to say console.log or maybe like not really respond rest like this because we already have a rest right here right so if I go ahead and console log this response, let's just go ahead and see what happens. So I can say user created successfully, something like this. And uh, once we take a look here, if I refresh this, if I say admin and admin right here and submit, you can see that in the preview, we get status okay, which is absolutely fine, right? That means we did not get this catch block here. And if we go ahead and take a look in the terminal, we can say user created successfully with the response value being the actual record, which we just created, right? So we have the ID sort of thing for the person, which we could probably use for, you know, JWT authentication, for example, right? Which we'll take a look at later on. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically how you're going to create a new record for the user. Now, the reason I wanted to, you know, just put this in try cache block is because let's just go ahead and try to submit the form again. And this time you're going to see that we get status error instead of status. Okay. So, you know, what went wrong? Well, if we take a look in the console, you can see that we get a Mongo error, right? Which says duplicate key error collection, right? Now, why did this happen? is because if we go ahead and take a look in the schema, you're going to find that we had a unique true assigned to the username, right? So that means no two users can create a record with the same username, which is pretty cool because we get this validation just out of the box. And for the most part, this is required in almost every application, right? You never really want two users having same username or email addresses. So yeah, that's, that's how you're going to do it. That's pretty much it for this video. In the next one, we're going to be seeing how we can handle the errors gracefully and just let the client know about things as well. So that is all for this one. I'm going to see you in the next video. Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, let's just go ahead and see how we can error, how we can handle these errors, right? So you see, usually with node, you're going to see errors like this, but uh, 
What is really happening is errors sometimes have a bunch of different properties, but most likely a lot of errors have a message property like this, right? So if we go ahead and take a look at this message property and sum it the same form, you're going to see we get this message like this. And if I, uh, you know, try to just go ahead and probably json.stringify this error object, we're going to have a better representation of what all we can pick up, right? So if I go ahead and submit this, you can see the stringified implementation of the uh, error object is something like this, right? So what we can do is we can probably go ahead and pick up this dot code, right? So the error dot code, if it is 11,000, that is, you know, probably binded to the duplicate error key message. So that is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to say if error dot code is equal to, uh, you know, not really code, but 11,000 right here, which means that this is a duplicate key, duplicate key. So I'm going to just go ahead and say status error and error is duplicate or maybe like username already in use, right? Something like this. Otherwise, I probably just want to throw the error itself, right? Because this means that something else has gone terribly wrong. It might be like, um, you know, your connection might be broken and it might not have been restored for a long time. The mongoose, your connection, in which case it is probably better to crash your program and let it restart. Or there's something else, right? There's some permission issue, something else, right? So you don't really want to handle the error which you don't really know about. So that's that's basically it. And once you have a status OK, that's also fine. One more thing which you could do is pretty much just go ahead and say right here a bunch of things. You can say that if username, uh, like, you know, if there is no username, that is username is empty or, you know, the username is just not present or type of username is not equal to string. You just want to say, you know, something like return rest.json status error. This is something which I follow personally, the status data error sort of object where you perform the status, you give the status as okay or error, the error is gonna contain an error. If there is no error, then there would have been a different property called data, which will just contain a success message or whatever, right? So once we have this in place, the error for this one would be invalid username. Similarly, you can have a similar check for passwords so you can say type of password is not string, then you can say invalid password, right? You can, with passwords, you can perform another check. You can say if password.length is less than, I don't know, five or six or 10, whatever, you can just go ahead and say that, hey, your password should be, password too small, should be at least six characters, right? Now you can go ahead and implement a regular expression or some sort of thing here as well as a good practice to have uh, all sorts of combination, but I'm just going to leave it for now uh, for that part, right? Because sometimes it becomes a little bit more of a, uh, you know, that experience for user where people just don't like your service anymore, which is, you know, just, you're just asking about uh, having different variations, caps, small, so it, it might get tiring uh, real quick. So that's why I just try to keep it at length only, right? So that's, that's yeah, that's pretty much it. If I try to submit the form, now you can see that, uh, well, we get an error inside the promise itself, cannot access password before initialization. So yep, that is because our password is in fact plain text password, right? Because our main password is right here. So if I go ahead and submit it again, you can see that we have another problem with passwords. So I think we are using it again somewhere here. All right. So finally, if we go ahead and submit this form again, you're going to see that we get nothing on the console, but we get username already in use, right? So if I go ahead and say admin, we get an okay status. If I go ahead and limit the password, you're going to see we get password too small, should be at least six characters. So we basically have everything in place. What we can just do is we can say that if result.status is equal to OK, that means everything went fine. Otherwise, oops, otherwise something went wrong, right? So I can just alert result.error, right? 
So now if I go ahead and refresh this admin and admin, and if I submit this, you can see we get an error, username already in use. If I do an admin two, we'll get same error because well, that is also in use. Admin three gets us there, right? So we could probably just throw in a hello success right there, but I don't know, it gets the job done, right? So yeah, that, that completes our successful registration of the user. The next step is to log in the user, right? And for that, we'll be using JWT. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for this video. In the next one, we're gonna be seeing how you can use JWT in order to log in a particular user. And uh, yeah, just transport the information securely. So that's all for this one. I'm gonna see you in the next one really soon. Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, we're gonna be taking a look at how you can implement JWT login with Node.js Express and all that stuff. Now, I don't know why people um, are so confused usually about JWT. It is a very, very simple technology and uh, it's very clever actually. And I'm just gonna tell you really soon, really quick how it works, right? So we all know that JSON is a, is a sort of a format which you can follow to send data to and fro, right? So you see that in fact, even with the APIs, we are sending JSON uh, like this, right? With a status key and error key. Now, this is all fun, but uh, what happens when you want, uh, you know, your client to say something about their authentication, right? So what do I mean by that? Let's, let's take a look at why we need JSON, right? So every time your client connects to, a, not really JSON, but JWT. So every time your client connects to server, your client somehow, somehow has to authenticate who it is, right? Because why? Because your server is a central, you know, sort of computer or a group of computers which you control, right? But client is a computer which you do not control, right? You do not know what that computer is, what is what IP might it have, um, you know, what, what sort of person is using it, it, which country it is. So you do not know all that stuff unless that computer is connected to you, right? So your client has to somehow prove that it is saying what it is, right? So if the client says that it is John, then you have the client has to prove to your server that it is in fact John, right? So there are basically two ways to do that. The first one is client proves itself somehow on the request, right? And the second way is client server share a secret, right? Now, what do I mean by this? And this is basically a single thing itself. If you if you take if you think about it in a in a in a little bit of depth, but uh, the idea here is that this is the JWT region and this is the cookie region, right? So the cookie is a shared secret between a client and a server. So it's basically, um, you know, a sort of a password you can think of which your server sends to the client, and every time client connects back to you. It sends that cookie back automatically and you as a server restores the session from database or Redis or whatever you're using and then you work with the client, right? So this is this is like uh, one way. The other way is that the secret, you can say the secret itself has certain attributes and certain data stored in itself which automatically verifies, Why? Right? Because this secret or maybe like data is non-changeable and we're going to take a look at that just in this video why this is non-changeable but before that or maybe like we can just go ahead and do that so let's just go ahead and take a look at this jwt.io website and if i go down here you can see that this is an example of a jwt token right now this looks random at a first glance but this sort of you know interface breaks it down very nicely you can see a JWT token would have exactly two dots um, in the in the whole token, right? Which are which acts as a separator for different things, right? So the first thing that is from starting to the first dot 
is the header of the JWT payload, right? And this, all of these three parts are actually base64 encoding of stuff. So if you try to decode this from base64 to regular ASCII, you're gonna get all this stuff, right? So JWT is not encryption. JWT is not for storing sensitive data. It's just saying that, hey client, you can go ahead and use this token to communicate with me and I would automatically know whether you are what you are what you are saying you are or not. So you see the main data which we share is this particular payload, right? So if I go ahead and you know just go to the console and if I say B2A and I paste this payload, not really B2A, A to B. And if I paste this payload, you can see I get the JSON representation of the data which this JWT token is following, right? So this JWT token is only and only following this much data. The rest of the data is just used for a validation, right? Of validation that this data has not been tampered with. Now, how that validation is performed is this light blue text you see right here is the signature, is the hash, right? So you see that with passwords as well, we store the hashes of the password. We don't store the actual password itself. Similarly, this hash right here is some sort of hash of this data which the server generated, right? Now, very cool thing with hashes is that once you change even a small bit in the actual, you know, payload, that is hash of password is X, right? If you change password even a little bit, you know, doesn't really matter. If you change this O with zero, this would be something else um, entirely, right? So this is the good thing about hashes. So you know that if this hash has changed, if the server determines that, hey, the hash of the payload which the user sent does not match with the hash which is available in the payload, then something is fishy, right? And you're just gonna reject that request. Now, what is the possible use case of this, you know, hash validation? Is that, for example, if you had something like a field like admin is false, on a person, right? And if somebody just goes ahead and says that admin is true, right? So if that happens, then this hash would not change from that particular person's, you know, end. Why? Because that particular person does not know a secret key which only your server knows, right? Because only you on the server generate the full JSON token. The client just uses it or, you know, just passes it back to the server. So once the client does not know about the hash, they cannot really really change the hash. That means they would fail the JWT token validation and uh, there is no possible attack, right? So yeah, the main purpose of JWT is to actually store data inside the secret itself. A cookie might be something like this and then you have to take on the server, you have to take this cookie and extract out the session from a database like Redis or Mongo. But with JWT, your data is well inside the payload itself, the cookie or the secret itself, right? So yeah, that's that's basically a very small overview of JWT, why you're gonna need that and why um, sort of it is a good choice. It's a good choice because you, you know, just remove databases from between as a dependency. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it just keeps your servers a little bit stateless, right? You don't really have to maintain and store state. So that means JWT is much more scalable compared to other solutions. One downside of JWT obviously is if you can see that the payload would increase um, as you increase the number of fields. So the best way to not, ma not make sure of that does not happen is that you use minimum amount of fields which you want, right? Just for example, username, email should be just fine, right? So there's that. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for JWT tokens. In the next video, we're going to be seeing how we can implement them, validate them, do all sorts of stuff, right? So that's all for this one. I'm going to see you in the next one. Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, let's just go ahead and take a look at how you can set up JWT um, inside Node.js, right? So first things first, let me just go ahead and create an endpoint for API slash login. And this is probably not the first thing first. The first thing first should be the actual view. But anyway, it does not matter. So I'm just gonna say res.json status. Okay, status, nothing much, right? And let's just go ahead and clone this page 
to create a login.html here right and i'm just gonna keep most of the things same probably change it to login login this could change to login as well i don't know right and this one would change to login as well so we get the username password we send it to api login and this time we send it like this if rest.status is okay that means we got the token right so i'm just gonna say console log got the token and the token is gonna be result dot data right now this is something which we have to populate so i'm just gonna say go back to the server and say data is something random right so now if i go ahead and take a look here if i go ahead and refresh this and go to slash login dot html instead we're going to have a login page and if i try to log in you can see we get the token as uh, well whatever passed right here uh, if i say something like coming soon then we'll probably get coming soon right so that's fine now with that thing being working what we really want is first of all we want to evaluate if the username and password sent by the user is correct or not right before actually going ahead and authorizing them with the json token so to do that i'm just going to perform a very simple uh find command on the database right so i'm going to say user is user dot find one because we're sure that there's only one user right and i'm just going to pass in username and password like this now there's just one problem with this and i can just go ahead and pass in a lean because we don't really need all that mongoose magic so the dot lean just returns us a very json simple object representation of the document right instead of all that fancy mongoose methods so the only problem here is that the password which you see the user is going to write the plain text password again right but if you remember we did not store the plain text password in the database because that was unsafe we stored the bcrypt version of the password so there's no way that this query would ever succeed for any user because well bcrypt has almost a different format than plain text password the problem here will be that the password which you compare is going to be plain text just like i said and it's not going to match the database now the you know the feature of bcrypt not really a problem but a feature of bcrypt is that a single uh conversion will never return in the same string what do i mean by that let's just go ahead and require bcrypt inside this bcrypt.js and do a hash sync of hello with a two iteration right you see we get this string if i try to run the same command again you're going to see that we get a different output you know this is cisa7 this is q7bq right so if i run this a lot of times you can see that the output is never same right so you cannot really pre-compute the hash and then compare it like that that won't work so what you have to do in order to actually make this work is firstly you have to find the record anyway right you have to find the record anyway without the password but now you have to be very very careful that you use the inbuilt library function right so you want to say that if bcrypt dot compare the password which is you know the password which you're passing as a plain text and the actual hash of the user which is going to be user dot uh password in this case right and we can just await it this means that the username password combination is successful and how do we know that the username is correct because we were able to find a record number one the password is correct because the hash this dot compare can compare two different uh you know a single string basically and can compare if the hash of that string is one of the possibilities right so there's that now again before this you want to check if the record in fact exists so if it does not exist you want to just say return rest.json status error and error could be invalid username password right you also don't really want to convey the correct information that what is invalid either username or password right because that would just mean that the other person is able to brute force 
uh, for a particular given correct variable. So if that is the case, well, good luck. You are clear, right? So the data would be the token, which will come to in a little bit of time. Um, if that is not the case, what I want to do is I just want to say status error. And again, basically the same thing, invalid username password, right? And error would be invalid username password. Now the JSON, the JWT could be, and uh, this would be a token, which we will generate by using a package known as JWT or not really JWG, JSON web token. So let's just go ahead and install it. Yana JSON web token. There's that. Now you can just go ahead and import it like JWT is required JSON web token like this. And now you just have to say JWT dot sign. And then you have to specify what you want to sign, right? This could be a string object buffer could be anything. Now in our case, it would be a object and this would be an ID of the user. So that would be user dot ID and the username of the user user dot username. Now remember that this information is public. That is, it is not hidden from user or anybody who's using the browser or whatever. Uh, not really anybody who's using the browser, but you know, you get the idea on the website. So you don't really want to have a very sensitive information like credit card or something here, right? Because it is visible publicly. So you just want to have minimum, bare minimum information. And there's that. But the sign right here, you can see the sign actually expects you to pass in a secret or a private key as well. So for secret, we're just going to be using a long string. So you can say JWT secret, something like this and define it somewhere safe in your environment variable. And you can just bang your head on the keyboard for this one and it will just work fine, right? You can probably just go ahead and insert some more special characters or whatever, but yeah, you get the idea. So once we have our JWT, JWT secret, we're going to be sending the token like this. Now, remember the secret is super duper important because if this is leaked, then all of your JSON payloads could be manipulated, right? Because they could be signed again by the end user. So you absolutely want to make sure that nobody in the world knows what your JWT secret is, right? This is the only responsibility you have to take care of at the end. Because if somebody knows and you have to change the secret, then all the previous JWT tokens would become invalid, right? So that's, there's that. That's you have to take care about. Now, once we have that in place, let's just go ahead and take a look. So firstly, I'm going to go back or maybe like open in a new tab. So I'm going to go to the registration page. I'm going to say Mehul and Mehul and submit the form and I get success. Now, if I go back to login and if I try to log in, submit the form, you can see we still get the success token and we get caught the token as this one. Right now, if I go ahead and try to A to B this, that is decode this part, but we don't want to decode the whole token. We just want to decode the middle part, which is the actual data. You can see this is what the server sent us, right? The ID was Mongo's ID. The username is Mehul. And this IAT time is uh, basically when the token was created. So yeah, now I have this JSON token with me, JWT token on the front end. I can send this token every time back on the database, on the server, and the server would immediately know if I am Mehul or not, right? Because if I try to tamper this data right here with username, this hash right here would change, which is the end hash. And I have no way to pre-compute this, right? I have no way to compute a new hash for the changed data. So that's why this data is secure. So yeah, that's pretty much it for the JWT uh, token generation. In the next one, let's just create an API, which is actually uh, something which only private users should access. And we'll see how that goes like, right? So that's all for this one. I'm going to see you in the next one really soon. Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, let's just go ahead and see how we can create an endpoint, an API endpoint in Node.js to actually let the user change the password, right? Now by this, what I mean is that obviously the logged in user can go ahead and change their existing password, but we'll be using only JWT tokens for authorizing the user. So first things first, let me just go ahead and create a new endpoint saying API slash change password, right? And the request response of this is going to be something like this. 
So I'm going to receive a token first of all, which is be which is going to be present in request or body, right? You could probably receive this as a header as well if you want, but I'm not really a fan of that. If you if you are, then you can receive it in a header as well if you want. But request dot body is also fine, right? Now, once you have that, this token right here is JSON Web Token. So your very, very first thing before doing anything at all is to make sure that this token is not tampered with, right? So how you do that? Again, we're going to be using the same JWT token and we're going to be using this verify method, right? So this verify method is going to take in a bunch of things. So the first thing is the token, obviously, which is what we received. And the second argument is going to be our secret key, which we use to sign it so that it can verify and decode the thing. Now, once you do that, it's going to give you the decoded version of the middle part. That is this particular thing, right? It will just omit the signature, you know, the signature and the actual payload uh, verification for you so that you can only get the body out of it. So I can just say user like this. And if you go to the verify, you can see that uh, if we try to probably console log it here, we're going to see what happens, right? So if I go ahead and do that, let's just go ahead and actually rest.json this uh, status okay as well, right? So if we go back to index.html, copy this, create a new file called change password.html, right? Just copy paste this. And uh, right here, just take a look at password and submit, right? What we're going to do is we're going to get the new password value. I'm going to say new password is password, right? And I'm going to also include the token here. Now, how do we get the token? We're going to be getting the token from local storage. So I'm going to say local storage dot get item token. But for this one, what we need to do is we need to also set the token once we receive it. So instead of, you know, got the token, uh, we can also say local storage dot set item token and the token would be result dot data right so it stores the token inside local storage so that it can persist on refreshes as well now some people sort of frown upon local storage for using json web tokens because it can be leaked with an xss attack or something like this but personally i'm not very uh sure about you know if this is a bad practice, right? Because if you have your site under your control, if you're not letting anywhere the user user data to go unsanitized, right? There is not really a lot of scope for XSS these days. If you are implementing the content security policy in the correct way, uh, if you are sanitizing, sanitizing the user input, uh, if you're doing all sort of stuff, if you know what you're doing, right? If you're using um, the correct tools for the correct jobs. But nonetheless, this is still a security concern for a lot of people. And I'm not saying that this is absolutely fine and they are just lying and that is not a concern. It is a concern if your code base is too huge to, mon to be monitored or for, you know, if you know that there are definitely excess vulnerabilities, then you should not store it in the local storage. But otherwise, it's probably okay, right? Because if somebody is able to access, uh, you got bigger problems as well, right? So anyway, once we have the token with us, we are sending it like this. I want to send it to change password instead of register, right? And uh, yep, rest of the stuff remains the same. So let's just go ahead and log in again with Mehul Mehul. And if I submit this, let me just refresh this first of all. Login summit, got the token. Okay, and now if I go ahead and see the local storage, you can see we have the token. Now if I go to change password, and it says registration, but it should probably say change password. Hit save, refresh. And now if I go ahead and say one, two, three, four, five, hit summit, you can see we get success. Well, nothing happened on the back end but you know it's fine we see that we call change password right but if we go back into the console you can see that we get this log right here which is the log from this statement so i can say this is jwt decoded like this 
And if I go ahead and submit this again, we get success and I get JWT decoded like this. Now, let's just try to become fishy and uh, try to mess around a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy this request as a fetch request and I'm gonna go back to console and I'm gonna paste this right here, right? So this is an actual request which is being performed when I click on this button. But what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take this payload, you know, the center, the middle of the data, and I'm gonna run this through A to B. You see, we get this data. I'm gonna json.parse it, right? Oops, let's see, json.parse. So we get this object right here. Now I'm gonna say x.username is admin, right? So I will try to change the admin's username. And I'm gonna say, you can see x is this, json.stringify x, and then I can say b2a to this whole thing, right? So we got a new payload. And if I try to go ahead and take a look at the request again, which we had earlier. So let me just go ahead and copy this, copy as fetch, go back, go to console, paste it right here and paste the malformed uh, payload, right? So I'm gonna replace the center payload with a payload which is gonna consist of admin, right, as the username. And you can see that there's not much change in the, uh, the payload itself, but the only change is going on here in a few characters, right? But this change is sufficient enough for the signature match to fail. So if you go ahead and hit this as enter, what is gonna happen is we get an internal server error, and the reason for that is because this JSON verification fails. You can see it fails by saying invalid signature. That means that signature was not valid for the payload which we received. So that means nobody can just really, you know, mess around with your stuff just like that. So there's that, right? So you probably want to throw this in a try catch because you don't really want your server to crash every time somebody performs a malformed action. I can say status error, error, you know, somebody is trying to mess around with you, right? And uh, yeah, that's that's basically how you're gonna get the user. You can say console log user now. And now, once you are at this point, you are pretty sure that the payload has not been messed around with and the user is what you think the user is, right? So now you can say that the ID of the user is from user.id because remember that we were storing the ID of the user like this. And now you can go ahead and pretty much say something like inside an async block, obviously, user, oops, user.update1. And you can say the ID like this, and you can say set password to be the hashed password, right? So you're gonna have to hash the password again. So hash password is gonna be await bcrypt.hash, not hash sync, just hash. The new password is coming from the body again. So I'm gonna have a new password right here. New PSSWRD. Right there, right? And there's how you update it, right? You can probably throw in your password verification things right here. So these were our verification things, right? So you probably might want to extract that out in a separate function itself, but uh, you get the idea. So I'm gonna destruct it like that and uh, there we go. Right, we can probably replace this with password itself. P-S-S-W-O-R-D, and then we can get rid of this. So there's that, right? So now you can finally say status okay, and you can get rid of this altogether. So, oops, something's wrong, password, like this. Right, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. That's how you're gonna update a user. Let's see how, if it works or not. So let me just go ahead and refresh this. My initial password was Mehul. I'm now keeping it Mehul1. Summit it, right? So if I go back, oops. Oh, I get that uh, winky eye, right? Because I think my payload is corrupted. So let's just go ahead and log in it again. Mehul, Mehul, summit. We got the success message. Go back, change password. I'm gonna change it to Mehul1. Summit, and we still get that. Well, let us see why is that. So if you go ahead and take a look at the console log of the error, 
we'll be able to see that if I summit this, we get illegal arguments, string and undefined. And that is because of the wrong argument count, of course, right? We were using 10 rounds of salt before, so we'll be using that only. So let's just go ahead and just submit it now and we see success now, right? So there's that. Now, if I change it to mayhole 5 summited, we get success again. So now if I go back to login and if I, oops, login.html, if I try to sign in with mayhole and mayhole, it's not going to work, right? Because the password is changed. But if I try with mayhole 5, it works fine, right? So yeah, that's that's basically I'm going to implement a login registration and for, you know, password reset like that. So that's all for this video. I'm going to see you in the next one really soon. All right, guys, welcome back to the final video in which I just want to give you a little bit of direction where you should go next, right? So we have covered the fundamentals of everything required for a basic authentication, right? You have API endpoints, you can register users, you can log in them with JWT and uh, you can update sort of some settings as well, which is just the password in this case. Now, what I would want you to do as a homework practice, as an extension to what we have covered so far, is to go ahead and implement a sort of a profile.html page as well here. So try to implement a profile.html page, which shows a bunch of more information for the user. Now, this could be name, address, age, gender, anything you like, and you can, you know, just have blank fields there. Now, once the user saves that, you're gonna pretty much follow the same format but you can have a different API endpoint here. You can say app.post API update profile. And you can just go ahead and based on JWT authentication, just like we did with the chain password, you can go ahead and update their profile, right? Names and everything and all that stuff. Now, if you want to make it more interesting, you can add GitHub links and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, once you get the hang of it, how it is all happening, then it is not very difficult to do anything like that. So yeah, that's that's basically what is happening when you are trying to register uh, on a page which uses JWT and uh, username passwords. So it's as simple as that, right? I hope you are clear with what's really happening all along, right? There's nothing very rocket science going on here very much. So yeah, again, if you have any doubts, you can go ahead and ask it below in the discussions. But that's all for this video and this little mini course as well. Hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, the next steps after you just woke up with the extension is to obviously just go ahead and follow along with the Node.js backend developer learning path. We have completed this one project. Uh, more projects would be added here soon, but you can always go ahead and take a look at this and you can start working on different, different things as well. So that is all for this one. I'm going to see you in the next one really soon.